right? And with that, you guys prone hit prone to anti action. You have to yeah, you're gonna heal. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and this should be like really close to it. It's yeah, very yeah, directional. Testing, testing, okay. testing, testing, testing. <laughs> I was on TikTok the other day, and they had this uh, this clip where it was talking about muscle memory, and somebody like hit their face with something, and like, oh, there's an they untapped with their mouth. <laughs> there's anyway. an untapped market. You guys aren't uh, inve uh, in yeah, investigating. Yeah, we're live now. Uh, <laughs> we're live, but no, hopefully, no audio. No. Welcome to Pre-Tower with K&M Technology Group. Here we will have discussions and presentations with technical specialists about topics or problems that are affecting the drilling industry today. We strive to keep the discussion strictly technical with no sales pitches for products or services. But since we are conducting a technical discussion, for context you should know who we are and what we do. K&M is an engineering consulting firm that specializes in complex and challenging wells. We began with a focus on extended reach wells and have evolved into a company that handles any type of challenging wells, be it unconventional, HPHT, deep water, deep TVD wells, and more. Our highly trained team provides engineering consulting, training and best practices, and field supervision. We also developed ERA, 
are proprietary torque, drag, hydraulics, and geomechanic software, which makes well planning more accurate and efficient. To learn more, please visit our website at www.kmtechnology.com. Good morning. Welcome to Pre Tower with KM. Today is uh, Friday, June 24th, 2022. Uh, my name is Jason Kruger. I'm the operations manager for KM. Uh, and with me today, we have Mitch Abu Hussein, our engineering manager. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you all again. It's been a, been a while since we put one of these on, so nice to be back. Also, we have uh, Wes Jordan, uh, one of our remote operations specialists, works at KM. Good morning. I'm happy to be here. Good morning, Wes. Thank you guys for, for joining me. Today we're going to be talking about conquering longer laterals in Haynesville. And uh, in an earlier part of my career, I started my career drilling wells in the Haynesvilles and LWD. It was a very long time ago in the Pine Forest of North Louisiana. So uh, let's go ahead and get started and kick it off. So um, today we're going to be talking about the drilling challenges of the Haynesville specifically focusing on temperature, drilling parameters, followed up with some downhole tools, and then we'll have a discussion on big hole versus small hole, the eight and a half versus six and three quarter uh, discussion that always seems to be going back and forth. Uh, just to kind of give everyone a summary, I know a lot of our audience isn't too familiar. We have a pretty broad audience uh, worldwide, and just to get everybody up to speed on the Haynesville, the Haynesville Shale, is uh, located in North Louisiana, primarily North Louisiana, East Texas. Uh, it runs from about a 10.5 to a 13.5 TVD. It's a pretty deep shale. Uh, one of the things that makes the Haynesville different from a lot of the shale plays in the United States is that the temperatures are significantly higher, which does a lot of drives a lot of the decisions with regards to tool selection and well design. Uh, it began development in 2008, and as of 2021. Um, there was a, there was a big drop in information reported in the Haynesville when the uh, the price of gas dropped down in 2008. But as of 2021, there were 681 drills wells drilled, and the production this last month was about 14.5 BCF per day. There are about 68 rigs. There's probably a few more. This is a little bit out of date, but there's probably a few more there uh, currently with 47 last year. And on the right, you can see kind of the primary area. I don't know if uh, my mouse can show, but right up there in the northern part is pretty much where we're talking about the Haynesville Shell. Most of your activity is going to be, I think, right around the southern. The last time I looked, it's very active in this southern portion right here. Uh, so why are we here? Because the price of natural gas has shot up significantly in the last few months, along with everything else. I'm sure everyone's aware. Um, Hopefully when it gets cold, the prices will be down a little bit. Be nice, but uh, it's not looking that way. They actually peaked uh, earlier uh, this month. Hold on, hold on. What? Are you actually rooting for lower gas prices? Well, <laughs> as a consumer. <laughs> Do you forget as a consumer, what we're in? <laughs> as a consumer of natural gas lately, as of late, I like a few things down low. You know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's come down from nine to six dollars. I like a, respo I like a, a responsible price. price. Let's say that. This is a good I like price. a good responsible price. Um, earlier this month, I think it was around June 6th, uh, gas actually peaked around $9 and 37 cents, uh, MCF there. Um, currently it's around 623 as of, I think it was this morning we checked, uh, looks to be on a little bit of a downward drop, but I think it's probably going to hold for a while. Uh, I mean, compared to the past 10 years, still yeah. six, $6 is still, still pretty good. It's a, it's a decent Pretty price. healthy. Yeah. When I, when I look, when I looked at this and I originally made this presentation about a month ago, it was. 636 or something like that and yeah. at that time it was on this upward trend so you know don't let the when i uh, the so i started with k&m in 2010 and one of the first projects i went to was in the haynesville it was the first rig job that i went to was a part of my training i went to haynesville it was booming back then in 2010 and then um as the price of gas kind of went down the whole area because it, it is a it's it's a big natural gas play at least in the in the south i mean the, the you got the marcellus that's always <coughs> been gas for you know forever but uh, the haynesville being deeper it's a little bit more expensive to produce than, than the marcellus stuff so it's it 
the activity there is very tied to the gas price and and now it's it's kind of booming again yeah actually i think uh was that the well that had the big giant wall around it in the middle of town no 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 that no. was uh, one of my first jobs in Haynesville. k and was on location it's oh yeah small oil field man yeah very small oil field yeah it was a it was a small small operator that we worked with yeah um but yeah it was the Hamill family number one. It was right next to the river in the middle of Shreveport, in yeah. the city of Shreveport, yeah. So, uh, so one of the things the, that makes the Haynesville different than a lot of them is the downhole temperature. And um, what about the downhole temperature? So the bottom hole temperature is a, it's a major design constraint, you know, because it affects your, your tool selections which then affects your well design and your TDs. Everything's tied to the temperature. And a lot of the factors that impact ACD also impact our bottom hole circulating temperature, which is you know, your annual clearance, your pipe, pipe size, your rheology, your flow rates. And one of the things that we see a lot in the Haynesville is that operators tend to use a lot more flow than is required for, for an ideal hole cleaning situation. Um, now I'll get into that a little bit more later. But as the wells get longer, obviously, bottom hole temperature increases because you have rotational friction, but you also have annular friction, which actually plays a lot more, a bigger part in the overall temperature down hole, what you're seeing. It's not just, the, people think that the rotation, faster speeds, you generate more heat, that sort of thing. And you know, that's an easy way to kind of wrap your head around it. But it's actually, uh, your biggest influence is going to be your annular friction of the fluid. Uh, Another thing that impacts the the, the, the the temperature impacts is with the BHAs is because it's high temperature, then running rotor steerable becomes a little more yeah. challenging because mm -hmm. of the temperature limitations of rotor steerable. So not, not only do people run motors because it's cheaper, it's, it's also the temperature limit limits how much you can use rotor steerable. And back, like I told you, in 2010 that was my first job well at that time drilling 5,000 foot laterals was the norm so and friction tends to be pretty high here compared to some areas where even in a 5,000 foot lateral after you drill the first 4,000 foot of the lateral you just try to line up your BHA as best as possible and just rotate out because you couldn't slide anymore at 4,000 foot um, because of friction where you know um, in North Dakota, you drill through 10,000 foot with, with a motor, no problem, slide all the way down to, to, to TD. So, um, being higher friction and having to run motors also makes it a little bit more challenging also. Yeah, that was, uh, again, like I said, when I first started as an LWD, I was working for Weatherford and we had some really high temp tools at the time, 325, and they would get pushed to 335, 340, and they would die out in the 340 range. And we also had a rotary steerable as well. And that's one of the things, I, and I did a lot of, a lot of research on this, and you know, if anybody has any comments, please, please make them in the, on, the, uh, on YouTube or LinkedIn. Um, but tool selection for rotary steerable, especially in the small hole, the six and three quarter, which would be the four and a half, four and three quarter inch tool size. Uh, there's not a lot of rotary steerables out there in that yeah. size, and no one's, no one's really making them. I think Weatherford used to have them, but I think they've kind of pulled out of the U.S. market, so there's not really much available out there right now. Um, I did find a few tools in the eight and a half inch hole size rotary steerable that are in, I think Slimberjay has the ice tool, which mm. is, I think can go up to the 400 plus, I think maybe 405 was the advertised number. Um, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's really available for the wide market. Um, it's, it's a lot easier to build tools. So also in a previous life, I used to work for a Ramco um in the middle east and their production hole by far the norm is six and an eight inch hole they usually run seven inch and then drill six and an eight inch hole and then because it's such a big market i think they have over 200 rigs working um just there right now i think they have over 50 offshore rigs and it's a lot easier to build larger size tools like eight and a half and then as a demand requires you downsize it and so a lot of the modifications to tools to make them smaller were driven because saudi was such a big market but saudi doesn't really have like the, the high, the high temp, temp the yeah. high temperature issues that we have in some places here 
So that that may be a reason why there's not a lot of investment in in the smaller high temp tools. Yeah, and they they used to get beat up a lot. I remember thinking, I was like, how does anybody make money doing this? Because it's the smaller tools fail constantly, yeah. constantly because they they usually get beat up a lot, and then the temperatures are a lot higher than it was for the bigger hole tools. Yeah. So, but um, modeling can actually predict how to manage bottom hole temperature, the drill these wells, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> is what can we do to reduce our downhole temperature? And uh, right here on the right, this is actually one of your wells, Wes. Uh, Wes was, um, he is our one of our remote operations specialists. And when Wes first came on board with us, he was working for a specific client. And how many wells, how many wells did you monitor for them? It was, I looked at your file, it was... Quite a few, yeah. 30, like, 40, something like that? Probably at least that many, yeah. I would yeah. think so. Just, um... And this is just, I picked a random one. This was about an 18,700 foot well right here. And as you can see, the um, the ending temperatures were in the 340s, 350, <coughs> tapping on that a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, downhole temperatures in, in the Haynesville range with drilling is going to be between 325 and 365, given a little different factors. Where, where you are located, uh, Geographically, I remember it being hotter on one side of the Red River versus the other side of the Red River when I worked, you know, a good 5 to 10 degrees sometimes. Um, this one it looks pretty typical from what I remember seeing when I drilled there. And uh, the temperature gradient's a lot higher uh, than, than other places. It's over 2 degrees per under. Explain what exactly is on <clears throat> that graph. What, what's, so, the, what's the orange line and the red dots? So what we're looking at here are these uh, these red dots. This is your measured downhole temperature. So this is actually a tool in the BHA that is pulsing up what the temperature is downhole being seen at the uh, at BHA. And uh, right here, the yellow line, that is your static downhole temperature. So, you know, this is basically once we've kind of landed in the lateral and you're in the formation, the formation is as hot as it's going to be. So what what you're seeing here, this increase beyond the static downhole temperature is actually friction-generated heat from the rotation of the BHA as well as the fluid friction. That's really interesting because it's, I mean, it's mo most people would think that if you are circulating, there is no way to get the temperature higher than whatever the static temperature is. Yeah. Like that, that, that's what would go. Mm -hmm. If you, if you ask me without showing me this graph, my inclination would be your circulating temperature should always be lower Less. than lower than your static temperature because yeah. you're circulating and circle you you circulate one of the advantages what they teach you in drilling school is one of the advantages of circulating is for cooling <coughs> cooling the bit yeah yeah exactly and that's and i and that's that's one of the things that's driving these tool selections as well as like you see you're in the 340s and that's you're way outside of any rotor strip that's out on the market right now that's easily available for a six. And this was a six three quarter inch hole size here, mm -hmm. uh, Wes. So pretty much all the operators that we've dealt with in the last few years working in the Hainesville have been using a motor and MWD setup, a high temp MWD, and just sliding the ranges on TDs. the The longest one that I've seen lately is has been twenty one thousand feet, uh, which is approaching that kind of mechanical limit for what you, like Mitch described the. Wrote, slide as much as you can, directionally control, and then rotate the last little bit of it out. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what we got. And then here, right here, <clears throat> this is what uh, what I've been talking about. This is an example from a recent, well, let's see, is this yours, Wes? Yeah, this is yours. Mm -hmm. um, this is the same well that we just saw previously. And in practice, what we've seen is that operators tend to flow more than they need for ideal hole cleaning. Ideal hole cleaning falls around a 200 uh, feet per minute annular velocity. So that's more than sufficiently, more than sufficient flow to carry out your cuttings that you generate from, from drilling. On the right side of the plot, you can see that there's, there's there's the flow rate that we use to drill this well, which is right at 300 GPMs, plus or minus. Looks like they dropped it down a little bit at the end to about two, 270. And on the left side, these are your annular velocities. So this is how fast the fluid is flowing on the outside of your BHA. And uh, the line in the middle at uh, 200 and actually the line already on the right, uh, the purple one, that's your 300 GPM. So you can see that we are almost at 300 feet per minute. So almost 100 feet per minute faster 
than an ideal hole clean flow rate. So we're over over pumping our hole. We're overflowing way more than we need to. Is that is that fifty percent higher or is that hundred percent higher? Depends on how you do your math, right? It is fifty percent. Fifty percent higher. Yeah. Fifty percent higher. Okay. So uh hundred percent would be four hundred. I've I've seen people do it both ways. They're like I was like, yeah, really mathematically that's fifty percent to me, but okay, sure. I, I get what I you're would talking describe about. That as doing it the right way and the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> so uh but as you can see on the left, that's that's your annular velocity, and that is right around the two hundred GPM mark. So we can drop our flow rate significantly to and still be able to clean our hole in an ideal situation. Uh, so then that's part of good drilling practices as well as uh, hole design. And I think I don't why, know if I have why do next you one. think? Because this is it's not <coughs> just here; it's everywhere. Where typically in small size hole, because we can, um, uh, well, because we can. I don't know if you can if you notice, but if you look at the size of the drill pipe. So back at when I started, the norm was four inch drill pipe. The latest thing in the U.S. now is running four and a half inch drill pipe with shaved down like tool joints that are designed for four inch drill pipe just so they fit in the hole, which is what they're running here. Mm -hmm. um, so they can actually have, so it's, it's lower standpipe pressure and they can act, and they can pump more is one of the reasons. Um, so it's it's not just on this project. It's, it's fairly normal for people to pump higher uh at higher annual velocities in a smaller size hole. What do you think the drivers for that are? Typically? My guess is probably you, um, from what I've seen is a lot of people will do this weight and weight kind of method where they drill and they land their lateral. And so if they start to see cavings, they start to see instability, then they weight up their mud. They don't actually stabilize their well bore. So mm -hmm. that's one of the key components to this is in having an ideal flow is you have to have a stable well bore. Your well bore has to be the, the diameter that, that it's expected. You're drilling a six and three quarter inch hole. If this, if you don't weight up your mud and you have an unstable well bore and your hole starts falling in, your well bore is going to enlarge to seven inch, seven and a half inch, eight inch, it, in, it just grows. When you have these enlarged sections of your well bore, hopefully it's localized, but you know, it could be the entire section, your hole cleaning ability diminishes significantly. So that's a key component. So if we're going to go down this road and we're going to talk about targeting ideal flow rates, we ha we're talking about also stabilizing your well bore. And that's part of the, the fast drill process, you know, that we discussed last week is, um, is workflows. Part of, part of being able to drill, part of being able to plan is to have a stabilized well bore. If you have an enlarged well bore, a lot of this stuff goes out the window because you're no longer able to clean the flow, clean the hole with the flow rate that you have. Not to mention all the other drilling dysfunction things that can, the bad things that can happen, the twist offs and things of that nature and the loss of weight a bit and then all that, that that drives a lot of people don't understand that part of it so when we approach it from this oh well, let's see let's let the hole talk to me kind of stance and then we start to see instability come over the shakers it's usually it's already too late i mean a lot of these people have drilled these enough to know that hey we're going to need a 15 15 2 15 5 to stabilize the well bore otherwise we're going to start to see cavings but they still they still do it they still start off with a with a 14 or 14.5 and like, oh, we'll wait it up. And, you know, if we see any cavings, well, what makes you think it's going to be any different? So let's just start off with a 15.5 and drill a TD. And the operators that we see that actually do that and are responsible with their well bore stability management, they have a lot easier time drilling their well, targeting good flow rates, getting out of the hole and having casing runs. And it's just repeatability one right after the other. So hole cleaning is one. Um... We, we do see that a lot. Uh, uh, Sergey, uh, tell us where you're, where, where you're watching from. So what, one, of, some, one of the viewers also pointed out that is probably for motor performance also, so a higher flow rate, higher bid RPM. Um, so we, we do see that for people chasing ROP. My comment to that is there are so many other ways to get higher ROP. Um, you got four and a half. In, so... In a vertical hole, if you want more weight on bit, if you want more weight on bit, then you have to increase the length of your BHA because you want your weight to come from the from your BHA. In a lateral, you're limited to how, to how much weight you can apply 
um, based on your buckling resistance. And when you go to four and a half inch in six and three quarter, you're able to apply a, a lot more weight. Um, now you're drilling with a motor, so I realize you're not drilling with weight on bit, you're drilling with differential, but the way that you get differential is by applying weight on bit, right? Um, it, so you could run a more aggressive bit. Um, you could uh, possibly run a higher torque motor. There, there's a lot of ways to get higher ROP than just spinning the bit faster. And if you spin the bit faster, actually, you're, for a steady ROP, for a given ROP, if you're spinning the bit faster, your MSE actually goes up. So it's not drilling as efficiently either. Mm-hmm. And then I would say the third one is due to this theory that if you flow faster, you're going to cool everything down yeah. more, which I guess is one of the main topics of this conversation. Yeah, let me let me go to my next slide. I've got a really good, really good slide that kind of... Uh brings this into focus here. <clears throat> so this is um, drilling challenges in Ansible. This is uh, this is a temperature snapshot. So what this plot is showing you right here, and uh, I, I made a longer well. I took the same well that we drilled, and I just made it a little bit longer. I added a few thousand feet because I wanted to show how the temperature affects the uh, the well bore with regards to flow. So what we're seeing here on the uh, on the left plot that first top little blue circle that I got there, that's uh, 340F, 18750. So that is from our first plot that we showed that had all the measured uh, downhole, bottomhole temperatures, and that's at the 300 GPMs. Well, I reduced those GPMs, and I, I modeled it, and you can actually get an extra, what is that, 19, 21, 3,000, 3,000 extra feet before you reach the same temperature just by controlling your flow rate. Just by targeting an ideal flow rate, you can get an extra 3,000 feet of your lateral if tools are your limitation, if temperature is mm-hmm. limitation. So targeting an ideal flow rate allows you to drill along a lateral. But it goes back to our previous conversation. The hole has to be stable. It has to be engaged. And uh, like I said, the, well, the operators that focus on wellbore stability make that their primary concern. One of their primary concerns, they've been steadily reaching the 21,000 foot mark recently. And um, uh, I think it really goes to show that it, it works you know, just by targeting that. Are you, are you going to share, are you going to share where that temperature, how that temperature is generated from, from the flow? <clears throat> You're talking about a, a, a temperature uh, tornado plot? Not a temperature tornado plot. Maybe it's a, so because you're measuring, you're measuring, so that's measured, but the, Going back to the slide with the red dots, you're measuring temperature right around the BH. Yes. Right. Yes. So higher temperature when you're breaking rock, that's generating heat. Mm. But if the if the fluid is coming out of the bit cold, it it would have to generate a shit ton of heat just to increase the temperature that much before it goes by the temperature sensor in you know within a fraction of a, a few seconds, right? So it means that the temperature must be coming out of the bit already warmer. Yes. So, I mean, inside of your drill pipe, you, you've got friction. So th- that's what these two, uh, I guess, to better explain this, the solid line is the interior of your drill pipe, the friction generated heat inside of your drill pipe. So it's getting hot as it goes through your drill pipe, and it's getting hotter as it comes out through the, the analyst. So, yes, there's a lot of heat generated as the fluid's getting pumped down hole. And then as it comes out the bit and goes out, out of the hole, I mean, it's, it's not coming out cold. That's, that's, right. I think that's a popular misconception that it's just coming down the BHA, and it's coming out ice cold, and it should be cooling the bit. No, no, it's, it's in a restricted environment. So it's the, so it's, it's the it's fluid the, being pumped down. Yes. It's the friction inside the drill pipe as the fluid is being pumped. Yes. When you pump it faster, it generates more friction inside the drill pipe. So not only does your standpipe pressure go, go up, also, the temperature of the fluid goes up. Exactly, and the fluid doesn't know if it's inside the drill pipe or in the annulus. It just yeah. sees the just sees the friction. So, uh, so that that creates a new limit. So, as you've solved the temperature problem, what is the limit of the limit now becomes, as you said, the, the ability to slide. Mm-hmm. So it looks like with that about a 0.25 friction factor, you're going to run out of uh, the you're going to run out of hook load, the ability to slide. 
this is a this is a surface uh, hook load plot. So this is basically the, this is the easiest way to explain it. So what we're seeing on the left, the blue, is the ability to slack off. And as you get deeper, if you have a higher friction factor, you lose ability to slack off. That's lock up on the left. When the plot goes straight left off scale, that means your string's going into lockup. So you no longer have the ability to directionally control your weld. And so I think I might have thrown an agitator. Yeah, I did throw a couple agitators in this. So now that we've reduced our flow rate, this is an idealized plot here. I have to, I have to confess. Now that we've reduced our flow rate, we've actually gained some standpipe pressure on our manifold. So we now have the ability to add a couple tools to it, mainly agitators, which help mm -hmm. us get a little bit further down the hole by uh, having some vibratory assists to our ability to steer the well. And I put them in there because it's not rocket science. A lot of people are using agitators out there these days. One, sometimes two. I think I heard someone's using three agitators and BHAs. So that, you know, that's part of it. We've increased our ability to handle standby pressure so we can add a few more tools to help us drill these laterals. So with the assists of the agitators, ignoring rocking systems and everything else like that, because that's a little bit more complicated, but a different discussion. We can now drill almost, uh, what is that, 23,000 feet with, uh, with a 0.25 friction factor, which is in the realm of responsible conservative modeling. Um, we've now lengthened our previous well from 18.7 to a 23,000 feet lateral. So we've solved our temperature problem. We've gained standpipe pressure. We've added some additional tools to the string, which still are within the uh, standpipe pressure limitations. And we've now drilled to a 23,000 foot well. Wes, do you have anything to say? You've been, you've been quite... <laughs> it's quite, hard to jump in. I'm just trying feel to... Feel free, man. So what? So you spent a lot of time looking at these, analyzing these, looking strictly at the data. What were some of the challenges that you saw as a remote guy, just looking at the data, thinking about all these factors? So, I mean, uh, tool failure was definitely uh, prevalent on the wells that I watched and, mo and mo motor trunking and things like that. Things just were not standing up, especially as the laterals got longer. Um, temperatures were always high because the flow rates were always in excess of optimum as well. And, um, yeah, so it, it, it's, it seemed like, um, like just adjusting for those things could have, could have en enabled for the, uh, the longer laterals as we, as we have modeled here. Um, putting you on the spot and testing your memory. Um, do you remember what kind of, how, what kind of differentials were they running? <coughs> um, I think I think they were mostly su uh, sub five hundred uh, or sub. Okay, so that's not ridiculously high. But the, they also had uh, issues with their uh, their zeroing of of that at the time. Okay. So so the accuracy usually had to be compensated for. Oh, uh, the old zeroing weight on bit for sliding. <coughs> oh, and, and zero M differential as well. Oh. Sometimes they would even adjust flow rates and not re-zero. So. Yeah, they they had they had some issues uh, with regards to that, but you know you you can you can compensate <coughs> for that if you just take the measured off bottom and just you know look at it that way. But they, they generally speaking, I didn't see uh, anything too much in excess. Yeah, as my recollection goes, that's that's uh, the the weight on zero and the weight on bit. That's from my uh, my Eagleford days, and because I wasn't a directional driller at the time uh, when I was drilling the Hainesville, and then I moved down to the Eagleford, and I remember we were working on this one one rig, and Whatever the, whatever the situation was, we couldn't run more than 25,000 weight on bit at the time. Mm -hmm. And as you guys can see from this from this plot, the line in the middle is the rotating weight. So when you finish drilling down the stand, you get your rotating weight. That's where you, at the time, that's where we zeroed. And with a can't run more than 25,000 weight on bit, you start to get down some of these laterals. You can see right here, you don't even get to the point where you start to be able to slack off and even move the BHA. So as the drilling superintendent, it, he came up on the rig floor. I was like, man, I can't even slack off 25 and even get the string moving. And, you know, is it because and we can we knew that once we got it moving, that's that's oh, that's applying weight. So I asked him, I said, do you want to get from the rotating weight or do you want to get from the first moment of movement when we break friction? And I just remember he said, yeah. <laughs> there, there are so many things in the. In the, it, it's really frustrating because everybody defines things differently. People define. So going back to my comment earlier, there's right and wrong. Well, there's right and wrong with this also, right? Right 
weight on bit is you need to be slacking off with like off bottom pick up slack off and when you're tripping in with no weight on bit because bit hasn't touched bottom yet that it should be when you zero your weight on bit um so that's one but you're you're saying that they're not allowing you to slack off below rotating weight well yeah that's going to be really hard to slide drill when they're yeah. forcing you to do that we've worked with operators where they're like we can't trip out from tv why can't you trip out because we can't we can't have an overpull over a hundred thousand without getting permission from town okay well, you probably don't want to overpull a hundred thousand anyway he's like yeah but like we were and, and they're defining their overpull over the rotating weight yeah so in you're showing here like what is that like about a 225 is your rotating weight 325 is a 0.2 friction factor so anything higher than a 0.2 friction factor if you're defining overpull like that then yeah you're not going to be able to pull out from td if they're limiting you to 100,000 over your rotating weight but a correct overpull should be whatever you're picking up normally figure out what that friction factor is so if 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 you have a 0.2 friction factor, the normal pull should be 325. So 100,000 over pull would actually be 425. Which in this case, you know, it puts you towards the the limits of the pipe. Um, but yeah, it, it's it, it's a lack of understanding, um, and, and I would say education also, like telling people this is how we want. For some reason, there's no standard of what an overpull should is defined as, what a, you know, what what a, you know, a set down weight is defined as, like a weight on bit. Yes, you have to you have to be tripping in before you zero. Yeah, I think that's that's a that's a whole another discussion right there. Yeah, <laughs> now, that's why we take that's why we take pickup and slack offs every connection, every other connection in a, in a lateral to understand what those limits are and where. We begin to uh, trip in, trip out, and, and pike moving down hole. And a shout out to Angola, also. That's where Sergey's at. Oh, uh, so I've been there. I've, uh, Sergey, where, yeah. Um, so, yeah. All right. So then, uh, big hole or small hole? <coughs> so I, I, man, I was I was looking at this, and I thought I could come up with something groundbreaking. I mean, I know a lot of people looked at this. We we've we drill with operators that do the six and three quarter hole size and we drill with eight and a half inch hole size. And, uh, again, down in, uh, the Haynesville, the, the, the holes are 21,000, 20,000, 19,000, 20,000, whatever, eight and a half inch hole. We see significant longer runs other parts of the country. However, they don't have the same temperature, uh, problems that they do in the Haynesville. Um, but with a with a six and three quarter hole, you're going to have a pretty set hole size previously, and then your your seven and five inch casing, intermediate casing, um, which then requires a certain drill pipe size. So all of these things lead to another. Generally speaking, the six and three quarter is going to run about ten. Uh, I ran a bunch of different simulations. The temperature is going to run about ten to fifteen degrees Fahrenheit lower uh, for ideal hole conditions. So <clears throat> comparing these two hole sizes, you you can't do an apples to apples. On, on flow rate, I was comparing them with regards to AVs. So I was targeting ideal uh, hole cleaning uh, AVs for both sides. And then obviously for a bigger hole, it's going to take more fluid flow. But for both of them, equalize with regards to annular velocity, your six and three quarters is going to run about 10 to 15 degrees slower. Uh, obviously, you got a little bit of buckling resistance. It's going to limit the lateral length with your conventional assemblies. And again, it goes back to the rotary steerable uh, discussion we had earlier. And that there's not a lot of tools in the market for this. So you're pretty much just looking at motors, motors and MWD for six and three quarter. Again, you're also going to have higher sandpipe pressure and your ECD, ECD sensitivity is going to be a, a lot larger. We've seen some uh, pretty significant ECD, I guess, momentary ECDs. I mean, uh, upwards of 20, uh, 21 sometimes that I've seen in some of the reports. And with... I have worked with a client that drilled with rotary steerable in the Haynesville in the six and three quarter. So I'm guessing that they must've been in a cooler part of the field maybe 
and that's why that they were able to do it. The reason why I point that out is because when 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 in our training, one of the things that we talk about when, with ECD is that um, uh, when you're rotating in small size hole, one of the things that can influence ECD is rotation. Um, sometimes you'll see it with stick slip. Like if you have stick slip, sometimes you'll see your standpipe pressure jump up and down, up and down, up and down, and your standpipe pressure is not mm-hmm. stable. And some sometimes that's because you're starving power and, and your strokes are actually fluctuating on your motor because you're operating against your power limit. But if your strokes are stable, but you're still seeing standpipe pressure fluctuations, even without a PWD, you can assume that all of that is coming from your annulus because rotating fast and slow is not going to affect, affect the pressure drop inside your drill pipe or across your bit and BHA. But around the outside, if you rotate faster, especially in a small size hole, then the fluid can start spiraling around your drill pipe. So the path that it has to fall flow is longer. And in the Haynesville, this, the reason why I'm mentioning all this is because the biggest the biggest um, effect on on ECD from rotation that I saw was actually in the Haynesville where they're running rotary steerable and they're f- their stain pipe pressure, um, just picking up off bottom and and flowing without rotation versus they were rotating, I think, at 150 RPM. Rotating at 150 RPM was 600 PSI. <laughs> so a 600 PSI increase in your stain pipe pressure just from starting to rotate, everything else being con- constant, you know all that's coming from your annulus. So you can see how much of an influence that rotation in the small size hole has on ECD. Wow. Yeah. Do you remember who that was? <coughs> mm-hmm. Who was the, uh, what rotary steerable did you run? I'm not sure what the rotary steerable, I know what the, the, the operator, operator was, but I don't want to share that. <coughs> yeah. I, d- I did, I do remember running some rotary steerables, some smaller size rotary steerables for, for Weatherford at the time, but again, I, th- I think they're out of the U.S. market. At, and we, it, it could operate in the 345, 350 range. Mm-hmm. Maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. You know, the, the temperature killed a lot of those tools. Um, but for the eight and a half inch hole section, so you can actually drill. Uh, your hole size is going to be hole higher. You got to change your well architecture to, to get to this point. And um, you get a lot better weight on bit transfer. You can drill a little bit longer in your lateral from, from a conventional assembly. So I, I use the same well profile, change the hole sizes, same BHAs, except same BHA setup, more or less. Um, but for a buckling resistance part, I actually was only able to get a few a few hundred thousand feet more. Um, a few hundred thousand control. feet? No, no, a few hundred. Nah. <laughs> 500 to a thousand feet more. 500 to a thousand feet more. Yeah. Uh, on the ability to slack off slide and then control your directional. There, there wasn't much to be gained, I think, from upsizing your hole from a motor MWD standpoint. I have an idea. I think I know what caused that. Do you have a theory? I, I I don't know. Just tell me. So one of the things, um, so the small size hole is, is six and three quarter of the four and a half inch drill pipe. So even when you buckle the pipe, if you buckle the pipe, one of the things that, why it ends up locking up and why it prevents you from sliding is when the pipe buckles, it exerts more side force mm-hmm. to prevent you from um tripping in the hole well if your annual clearance is bigger then that buckling will exert more side force because the the, it's more coiled for lack of a yeah a better term right where if the pipe is very confined even if it buckles it's just going to kind of snake back and forth or the coil is going to be really long and that amount of side force from the buckling is is not going to be as (coughs) severe and and the buckling resistance actually increases with reduction mm. in your annual clearance. So you got six and three quarter with four and a half inch drill pipe versus eight and a half inch hole with five inch drill pipe or five and a half. So the even though you can apply more weight on bit before it buckles, when it does, it, it when it does buckles, then the side forces will probably be higher. Is my theory that w- one of the things that's not going to be captured in all of that is. Because we, when we do torque and drag modeling, everything is friction factor, right? And people associate friction factor with coefficient of friction, which is not 
It's not it, uh, the friction factor is just a fudge factor of you know that we we substitute in the in the equation for drag we substitute coefficient of friction for friction factor and the friction factor accounts for a lot of things and what we've seen is typically in larger annual clearance the friction factors typically reduce which if it, if it was coefficient of friction the surfaces haven't changed so coefficient of friction wouldn't change but friction factor typically goes down so like your friction factors drilling 12 and a quarter inch hole are typically lower than you know, drilling eight and a half or six and eight inch or six and three quarter inch hole. Um, just because it's, the more annual clearance you have, the more forgiving it is yeah. to ha- not having a perfect hole. If you had a very tortuous wall path, um, if you had a very tortuous wall path, then the effective hole ID becomes very small. And if it be, uh, if it starts getting even closer to the size of your pipe, then you can see it'd be a lot harder to push something through that hole. Um, or the bigger annual clearance, it's like kind of driving down an open highway. It's yeah. more forgiving. Than yeah. More forgiving. So we're, so what, to, to I guess explain, explain what you're just saying is we're six and three quarter friction factor slacking off. We could expect pulling a number out of the air, 0.3. Sure. But with an eight and a half because of the larger it, hole size. It might be what, like a 0.25. 0.2. Yeah, 0.25. Something yeah. like that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that 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 give you a little bit more further down the line, allow you a little bit more directional control further down. That, that's what I would expect, <coughs> but just because this is supposed to be, there's supposed to be some education for everybody watching this. Yeah. So, like, I, I would expect that. Do not absolutely count I on that yeah. for su- the success of your well until you actually try it and see how much of reduction you have. Yeah. Uh, and then ECD reduction, obviously. Um. Uh, the bigger hole size, your UCDs come down, and then uh, you you open yourself up to a little bit more a wider market for your rotary steerable tools. So allows yourself to drill a little bit further. And we're we're seeing everything from just rotary steerables on pipe to motorized rotary steerables, and you know, give you a, an idea of how far people are drilling these wells up in the uh, Marcellus where we support projects. Recently had one drill a twenty nine thousand foot well with a motorized rotary steerable, so significantly longer. Shallower TVD, I think. Uh, I think they're running around seven thousand TVD. It's not the same. You know, it's not apples for apples comparison. You know, in case anybody that's operating in the Haynesville wants to see what anybody's doing in the Marcellus or West Texas or whatever, it's mm-hmm. not an apples for apples. Haynesville is a very unique, hot, deep, high pressure place as compared to a lot of the U.S. market. But people are out there drilling these long, long laterals if the conditions are right, if the uh, if the planning's right. Um, I think I did have one more point. Uh, yes, for the eight and a half. So this is a this is a pretty big thing for it as well. You would expect in a bigger hole, higher flow rate. What do you think is going to happen to the temperatures? Go up or go down? Like, it, it, <laughs> I, I would. I'll, I'll just go <coughs> with what I normally assume is that higher flow rate is going to reduce the temperature. Yeah. Um, you would you would think so. We actually uh, the the modeling that I did, the comparisons that I did uh, in this scenario, I guess you could tell from the the previous comment that they were lower. The temperatures are lower. Uh, I was comparing that to the eight and a half inch hole. So you're looking at a ten to fifteen degree increase with the eight and eight and a half inch hole as compared to a six and three quarter. So you're actually, if you upsize with the thoughts of decreasing your temperature and drilling a longer lateral, it's probably it may not be the best thing for you. Is is the point I'm trying to make? So uh, the six and three quarter from a conventional motor MWD standpoint, unless you're going to change to rotary steerable that can handle the heat, uh, you're probably better off going six and three quarter. Okay. Let's see. Wes, do you have anything? <laughs> anything at all, Wes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it just it just. Uh... So it's, it seems like when you are upsizing, your only reason for doing this would be for, to change to a rotary steerable that would uh, be able to accommodate. Yeah, I would, I would that. say it's, that's, what, that's what I've seen. That's what I've seen for, for different operators in different parts of the, the, parts of the country. Is, ECD. Uh, and ECD, well, as well. ECD as well. But yeah. Yeah, like I said, they're pretty, pretty, um, pretty resilient uh, in the Haynesville as far as yes. ECD is concerned. But even still, I mean, you'll be able to, uh, being able to drill uh, with a rotary steerable We'll get you. We'll get you farther if the temperature is not limiting factor. <coughs> yes. Well, there, 
I mean, there's a there's a couple of things, right? So if you drill longer laterals, um, and you drill them as a larger hole size, then that reduces your ECD while you're drilling. It also reduces your ECD while you're cementing, so you're more likely to get mm -hmm. a better cement job. Mm -hmm. It also allows you to run a larger production casing size. Um, so I know it, it typically five inch casing, I think, in six and three quarter inch hole. There's not a whole lot of clearance yeah, there. Right. So your cementing ECD is is going to be pretty high and, and you need to manage that. But at some point, your cementing ECD gets so high that that's not possible. The other thing is, is if you're drilling eight and a half inch hole, then typically the production casing size that you'd run in that is five, five and a half inch. And if you run bigger casing, then your hydraulics for fracturing are impacted pretty significantly also. So you get better fractures. So there's a lot there's a lot of advantages the downside is is it costs more because yeah. it's you know it's the larger size casing which i i i have heard that the cost of steel and casing and finding it is getting to be problematic now that's i, I was going to talk about that uh but i decided to leave that out on today's today's yeah. topics but uh that speaking with a lot of the operators that i spoke with in preparation for the show that was one of the main things they brought up. They said, man, you got to talk about price casing right now. I mean, we just can't get our hands up. Basically, we're just getting whatever we can, we can get. Yeah. yeah. And I I think the numbers that I got a couple months ago from somebody on what casing costs are probably not even the same as they are. I was anymore. teaching a course, and somebody said the cheapest casing that we could find right now, and it was, for, for whatever reason, they found, like, some hydro, um, like a wedge thread connection casing and that was the cheapest casing like all their like their other semi-premium connections were a lot higher and they're like what do you think about that i was like if you can find wedge that's cheaper than anything else just buy as much of it <laughs> and, and, and call them back ask them how much do you have of that and buy all of it because you'll be able to resell it i mean the, the wedge the red connection is kind of like the, the ferrari of all connections yeah. And if that's the cheapest stuff that you can find, then yeah, you probably want to grab all that, all the stuff that you can. Yeah. I think we're getting close to being done. Uh, Wes, do you have any other opinions or thoughts on the, on the matter? No, I'm just thinking like with the uh, larger hole size too, the uh, casing would also be more prone to buckling probably and maybe have a lower friction factor uh, being able to be run conventionally. So I know that... Um, on some of the projects we've seen where they've upsized, they've had to do mud over air or running empty yeah. in order to get it down. That's, uh, and again, something I didn't cover because uh, we talked about this uh, last time we looked at this. Floating casing in the Hainesville, not really not really an option in, in today's market. You're, you, because of the depths, because of the mud weights that you have to have mm -hmm. uh, for whole, st whole stability, you're looking at around a 10,000 PSI collapse gradient downhole which borderline very very borderline there's a few there's a lot no well, there's a few companies out there that are making the the, the float equipment that says 10,000 um i think with running speeds and everything it might push you north of that and i looked at a, a little bit of a shallower 10,500 foot well when i initially did that that look and it's very very borderline so if you're adventurous and you're uh you're a risk taker yeah you might be the first one but the equipment 10,000 is more like 90, 98, 70 is the limits they have on a lot of that float equipment. Everybody seemed to have about the same limits. I don't think anybody has a, has an 11 or 12,000 PSI float shoe out there. Not only that, like we, we, we did a course for another client, that, and this was not even in the Haynesville, where they were running mud over it. So uh, what Jason was saying is that, so standard float equipment is rated to 5,000 PSI. Um, you can get, and, and that's normally the that's normally okay because you're just worried about the U-tubing of cement. So it's whatever the difference between the cement, whatever, the, with whatever fluid that you have in there. And 5,000 PSI is usually more than enough. But if you're running the pipe empty, now you have the hydrostatic plus the surge when you're running, you have to account for all of that. Mm -hmm. And then when you're, you know, in the, in the Haynesville, what kind of mud weight? Uh, 15s, 15s, mid 15s. Yeah, close to 15, 15. So 15 pound per gallon at 12,000, 13,000 foot TVD. I mean, that's a lot of pressure, right? Yeah. 
So now you're talking about like 7,500 PSI float equipment, which is specialized is not good enough anymore. So you need really high rated float equipment. And then this other client, um, in the smaller size holes, usually if you're running mud over air, you're using some sort of baffle plate or some sort of disc or whatever that's that you're yeah. going to, that you're going to rupture where mud over air used to be, uh, the Davis Lynch kind of had the, like the, the lock on the system where it was a, a you know, a sleeve that you, you shifted and then it allowed communication. Then you, 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 you pump that sleeve all the way down to your, to your toe. I'm guessing the patent on that ran out because within the last couple of years, there's a lot more providers coming up with some mud over air systems, but all of them tend to be kind of like a baffle plate kind of system, whether it's ceramic or yeah, so, like a, some, some like, like disc. that, yeah. di- some sort of disc yeah. that you rupture. And with heat, then just, r- the, they were saying that they were having problems with those discs rupturing just from tripping in the hole, just mm, from running yeah. in the hole and st- you know, running every joint and then stopping that momentum of the fluid when it's stopping, you know, the repeated pushes on that baffle plate, eventually that baffle plate let, yeah. lets go and then you're not running mud over air anymore. And and that was not in the Hainesville. So, and if you're talking about the Hainesville, then the it's temperature is going to be even higher. So it's going to be more problematic. So those are some of the things that you need to think about also. Yeah. yeah. Well, think that is the end of our show uh thank Perfect. you everybody for for joining us today i think we had some pretty good topics we covered and, uh, yeah you know, enjoyed this discussing it with you guys thanks uh thanks wes and uh, yeah. jason for sitting for sitting in and, and sorry for people that follow us i mean we were doing this on a monthly basis but it's been incredibly busy for us yeah uh lately so we'll 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 try to do as much of them as we can yeah and we'll try to give you some notice but uh like always this will this will remain online so uh, you know you can check out some of the other topics that we did Uh, i did notice that we're not the best at going back and classifying each one of these pre-towers what exactly was the topic that was covered like on the on on the youtube it just says pre-tower with k&m but if you click on it, we have a bunch of them on YouTube. If you just click on it, look at the first 10 seconds, the topic will come up, and then you can see if you're interested or not. And if you're not interested, move on to uh, and go to our website, www.kmtechnology.com. All these videos will be there also. You can find them there. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, Mitch. Thank, Thank, you. You guys. Thank you, guys. Thanks for the people that joined us online. We will see you next.